Thank you, Lauren, for that very, very brief introduction. <laughs> Hi, for those of you who weren't here last night for Godless Perverts, um, I'm Stephanie Zavan. I am here out of Minneapolis. I'm the um, producer of the Humanist Hour and uh, interviewer for Atheists Talk Radio, and I used to be um, on the board of Minnesota Atheists, and I write at Almost Diamonds on the Orbit. Um, so you may or may not have seen me around. Those of you who were here last night um, know a little bit about why I decided I wanted to put together a polyamory panel for uh, this year's Skepticon. Aside from the fact that I really like panels and, and Lauren didn't want to organize one, so I said, well, I could organize one. And she said, just pick an interesting topic. So we're talking about sex. Um, Although we're not just talking about sex, we're talking about sex and relationships, which is actually more interesting and far more fraught. I have um, a long history. I don't really identify as poly, um, and that's one of the things I kind of want to talk about here. I have been in long and short-term um, polyamorous and monogamous relationships. So I have some experience with the, the topic, um, although we're not here to talk about me, I'm really just the moderator. So what I kind of want to do today is have not your standard poly panel, because your standard poly panel is a bunch of, um, frankly, right around 30-year-old white people telling you the one true way to do poly. Um, and I didn't want to do that. So I put together a panel of people who have very different experiences with poly and very different approaches to it. And I would like my panel to go down the row and introduce themselves, um, kind of give just a little bit of an overview of, a little bit of an overview of their experiences with polyamory. And we will get into the details after that. Josh, why don't we start with you? There we go. All right. Um, so my name is Joshua Hyde. I am uh, a 30-ish white guy. Um, <laughs> I'm currently living with my former metamor and three kids uh, of his, um, and then am also dating a woman who is married to another man and has another boyfriend and girlfriend on top of that. So that's my polyamorous life in a nutshell. And I'm not going to assume that everybody knows terms, so can you define metamor? Uh, that is the uh, basically lover of my lover or partner of my partner. Nola. Um, I'm Nola Olson. I'm also 30-ish white, so good job. <laughs> no. um, I'm married. I've been married for five years, and I have never actually been polyamorous, but it's something you've been considering. Um, I have two children, so we're trying to figure out how that would work with young children and sometimes lots of upheaval in life going on. So. My name is Hina Dadaboy. Um, I guess I've been openly poly identified for about six or seven years now. There was one relationship where we closed and open and closed and open. There was a lot of whiplash there. Um, I actually was interested in being poly because I found out about it before I even started dating, but I thought I wouldn't be able to find anyone who would be willing to put up with me and polyamory. Um, and so I spectacularly failed at my one and only monogamous relationship. And here I am. Um, been married for about, yeah, three years now been with uh, Danny, my husband, for six years. Um, I also am dating Benny, who will be introducing himself soon. And uh, I guess no labels or titles on this other person that I'm also dating. But yeah, I've had other relationships throughout my relationship with Danny. He and I started off poly. So I guess other than Benny, I'm probably the old hand here. Um, my name is Benny Vimes. Uh, I have been out, like, out as Polly for about 15 years, um, and uh, I am dating Hina, which is great. Um, I'm a really like, long-term relationship-oriented kind of Polly person, uh, so I also have a boyfriend of six and a half years who um, lives in Madison and is kind of my permanent home uh, with his wife and her boyfriend and the kid and the dogs and the chickens and uh, kind of a full house. And then um, I am married, for three years now uh, to a person living in Chicago um, who's amazing and, uh, and I'm, I'm very lucky to have all of those relationships uh, in my life. So I said I wanted to do not your standard poly panel. How do you, each of you, feel like the standard polyamory 
advice and, and actually let's start with advice and let's handle community separately in a separate question. But the standard polyamory advice applies to you. In particular, are there things that everybody thinks is the way that poly works that just doesn't work for you? And I, I think, Hina, I'm going to pick on you to start because I know <laughs> you've talked about some of this before. Oh my goodness. Okay. So first of all, I feel like every single poly book and poly relationship advice starts with the presumption that you were monogamous for a while with your partner and you're approaching polyamory as a couple, which actually doesn't apply to everybody. Granted, it's, I would say, a fairly common narrative and story, and I don't want to diminish that, but at the same time, people ask me, oh, so when did you open up with your husband? I'm like, I was dating someone else and he was dating someone else when we got together. There was no opening that happened. We both were poly, and even if had we both be, been single when we met, we probably would have still been solo poly, which people don't even realize that's a thing. I have friends who are solo poly. They aren't in any sort of nesting long-term or you know, super, I don't know what the word is, not committed, but um, they're not in any primary style relationships. They're not in a relationship where they would share a bank account or a house, but they still consider themselves poly, and so people forget that those people exist and they fall through the cracks. And then now that poly is getting more of a presence in the mainstream media, the types of people who represent poly are not only upper middle class, white, you know, white but appropriative of Indian culture, but that's a whole other story. Don't namaste me ever. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> but uh, those people will. But uh, the issue with them is that they tend to be, they tend to oversell the relationship part of poly. They'll say, oh, it's all about love. It's not about sex. And we just schedule ourselves so much that we never even fuck. And to me, it's like, what? What are you talking about? I love sex. I want to have all the sex with my partners that I care about and like having sex with. And sometimes I even have casual sex and there's nothing wrong with that. But I frankly feel very slut shamed by the modern uh, representation of polyamory in the media because they're constantly talking about how having casual sex is bad and you just have to be in love all the time and love is fine but sex is pretty great too in my opinion so yeah the um the couple coming into poly together story doesn't really work for me either um, I was already well into a relationship with Peter my boyfriend uh, when I met my spouse um, and uh, my boyfriend and their girlfriend were like stood up in our wedding. They were our um, our best man and maid of honor um, because those relationships pre-existed the one in which I live most of the time. Um, and I and there is sort of a common message in polyamory that uh, that everything can be can and should be sacrificed for a nesting or primary or married relationship. Um, and us breaking up with those external partners on behalf of the primary relation, well, we don't even really use the word primary that much, um, on behalf of that relationship just isn't even on the table. Like, they pre-exist us. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of why I talk about both Chicago and Madison being my home cities, because I have homes and bedrooms and beds and partners in both of those places, um, which I, I don't think is really a part of the common poly narrative. I mean, for myself, I think I was a bit lucky in that the uh, burgeoning poly community in Kansas City, which is how I got introduced into polyamory, um, very much tried to not take a hard stance on what is and is not the right way to do polyamory. So um, whether you wanted to just have casual sex partners, whether you wanted to have lots of long-term committed relationships, whatever you wanted to do, um, the, the, the constant advice was, do what you want as long as everybody's on board and you know nobody's getting harmed. Um, so I never really had to deal with inapplicable advice because the, the advice was fairly, I guess, uh, hands off or, or laissez-faire when it came to uh, how to do polyamory. I'd say it like I haven't actually tried anything like that and a lot of that I would say has a lot more to do with timing and the just everything in life being it's been in a, kind of a state of upheaval for us for a couple of years, but um, after having a second child, we just don't have much time. But every time I bring it up with someone, they're always like, but aren't you gonna feel jealous? Aren't you, you know, gonna have this like overpowering, like, doesn't that concern you? And since being invited on this panel, I felt a little odd being invited on the panel. I'm like, I don't know what I would have to add, but I would say that like to that response, I can only think of one relationship where I really felt jealous about someone's time and affection and attention and ended up that 
my fears for that, maybe I was reading something into it because the person was cheating on me. But like, as far as other people I've dated and even with Steven, um, I generally feel like, well, yeah, if you're going to go out, have a good time. You know, I, I want you to be happy, even if, even if there's nothing beyond happening, even if you're just going out with friends while I'm staying home, it's, you know, I don't really want to hold someone back from things. And actually that brings up something, I think when people talk about jealousy, there is so much advice about people who are reluctant to be poly, who are with somebody who's poly and how they can cope and how they can deal with that. There's very little advice for those of us, and I know that there are plenty of people out there who've been through this, where you are poly, you start a relationship that's allegedly going to be poly with this partner, and they get insecure and shut everything down. And there's a lot of societal pressure to conform to the norm, and the norm is not poly, despite what people in liberal cities like to assure me. Even in very progressive areas, it's a very tiny minority of people who are actively poly. And so you feel a lot of pressure to just yield, and you know, society tells us that, oh, you know, if you're the one wanting more sex, you're the bad guy. If you're the one wanting more relationships, you're the weird one. And so you should yield to the desires of your more conventional partner. And there's very little out there for people who have been in that situation, and I was in that situation for a long time. And it was rough, and I was deceived, essentially, because this person said they wanted to be poly and didn't want to be. But you hear the opposite all the time. People say, oh, well, I didn't want to be poly, but my partner pressured me. It's like, well, society, society in general is pressuring all of us to be mono, so. All right, before I get back to talking about poly community, we will take audience questions for this panel. Um, we have Steve right over here, who has very, very tiny cards on which you can write a question which is a short sentence that starts with a capital letter and ends with a question mark. We will be happy to take those. Just put your hand up if you have one and he will come over and, and bring you a pen and that and, and bring them up. So, um, following off of what Hina said and, and a little bit about um, what Josh was saying, we often think of um, polyamory as happening in specific communities that are set up for polyamory. Um, this is very counter to my experience, um, in part because the polyamory that, community that was around when I was young and, and dating was um, terrifying. How do each of you interact, if you do, with your local poly community? And if you, to the extent you, you don't, do you actually have difficulty, say, for example, finding partners? Or is the drive to find partners even something that you're particularly um, there for? I have absolutely no connection to my local poly community in either of the cities I'm in because I'm an atheist. Um, I was told very directly in Madison about 10 years ago, so I will acknowledge that this may have changed, um, but I was told very directly that if you were not spiritual, you were not welcome. Um, and they were happy to take spirituality in a wide range of forms other than Christianity. Everything else was totally fine, but Christians and atheists were totally ostracized from that community at that time. Um, and so I found other ways of finding friends and finding connection, finding partners uh, because of that experience. Um, uh, it also had a very strong tendency towards extreme libertarianism, which I'm also not real comfortable with. Uh, so for reasons of just like ideological um, objections, uh, I just didn't mesh well with the poly community. I haven't gotten as involved in Chicago because I'm really not looking for partners now. Um, so, you know, I found other ways and disconnected from the community and I, I do not feel like that has been a loss for me. Um, you know, for, for my part, you know, like I mentioned, there is a kind of a burgeoning organized uh, polyamorous community in Kansas City. I don't interact with that one directly much uh, in large part because there's another secular community called Kansas City Oasis that has a large uh, poly attendance already. Um, I remember my, my previous partner, she mentioned going there for the first few times and someone gave a talk about polyamory at, at Kansas City Oasis and asked everyone to raise their hands if they had been involved in some kind of, uh, you know, open relationship or something that could be considered long polyamory and most of the room raised their hand, or at least a, a significant percentage, and she ha had this kind of, oh, I'm, I'm not alone kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, for those times where I, where I need that poly community, I usually get that through Kansas City Oasis. It's, it's so strong, actually, that 
Right now, uh, my partner along with her husband and a few other people from Kansas City Oasis are at Houston Oasis tomorrow at a polyamory panel. So it's apparently a good weekend for polyamory panels. <laughs> I, I'm living here in Springfield. I don't even know if there is a public group. <laughs> I haven't even looked. The, the trouble with liberal areas or areas that are perceived as very progressive, like where I live in Southern California, is that nobody wants to organize. People think, oh, we're accepted anyway, so it's fine. Let's not worry about it. And that's true for anything from feminist groups to atheist groups. I mean, they exist, but a certain type of person tends to gravitate towards them. And they're usually people I can't necessarily relate to. So. I, I have attended the Southern California Poly Group, but it was in a really, really nice house, and everybody there seemed to have really, really nice jobs and houses and kids, which I want kids and can't afford them. So, like, it, it just, it felt like it was a different universe for me. And they also, on top of that, seem really, really committed to being a quote-unquote open and you know, free space. And so the that guy that shows up, they don't try to make him stop coming, even though he makes like 10 people uncomfortable. And I, of course, I tend to get targeted by that guy for weird things. And, you know, when, when I basically didn't flirt with him back, he asked me if I was pregnant, which is like a weird way to be like, Haha, you're fat anyway. So, you know, I didn't have a good experience, I left. But like Benny, I've sort of built my own little little circle. You know, I have people online that I'm friends with. I can post about Polly on my Facebook and nobody, sh or maybe an occasional troll, but I just block them. But usually people are either sympathetic or they don't say anything. They don't come on and say, well, that's immoral or something. And um, I also have certain people that are near and dear to my hearts that I occasionally go to when I need advice, because they are experienced and they are smart and I trust what they had to say. And Benny used to be one of those, but then we started dating, so no longer a, a neutral party. It's one way to find a partner. <laughs> okay, this question was definitely going to come up. Um, the question itself is, what safer sex practices do you use to reduce risk? Um, but I'm guessing that at least a couple of you have things more generally to say about um, particularly STD risk with partners? I mean, for us, it's, you know, when, if you're, when it was our triad, it was as long as it was between the three of us, protection wasn't necessary, but the moment um, anyone else entered the picture, uh, protection was mandatory, and there, there no ifs, ands, or buts. So, um, I mean, we, we kind of, I guess, kept it within the family. It's not right. The, right word I'm looking for, but, um, you know, it's, it's, we, we had this kind of, this circle of trust, um, and until, you know, either someone was brought into that circle or, um, you know, protection was, was mandatory. So that's, that's kind of how we kept ourselves safer. So one thing I want to go sort of after is, um, is digging a little bit into the sort of background of this question. Um, there's a, a lot of societal stigma about sexually transmitted infections. Um, and I think that that stigma is a problem. I think that it is often used to uh, shame people who have sex with multiple partners or sex that is outside of the um, societal norm. Um, it is also uh, often used to just scare people away from, um, from something like polyamory. Uh, what we actually know from sort of good uh, sexuality research is that people who identify as poly have lower rates of STIs than the general population. That's because we as a community tend to talk about this issue a lot um, and tend to be very open and communicative about sex. Uh, and the sort of, honestly, communication is the best protection against infection and it's also the best way of decreasing stigma. Um, so, while I do personally have safer sex practices that are important to me to protect my own health and the health of my partners, it's also really important to me to not send the message that people who are carrying an infection uh, aren't worthy of being in this community or of having partners, just that we need to communicate with each other about what our expectations are about protecting our own health. Um, yeah, I, th I think that that breaking down of that stigma is really, really important to me, and that's why uh, every time this question comes up, I kind of want to talk about what is behind that, to think about what the, the reason is for the fact that that is almost always the first question that comes up in panels on polyamory. All right, so... Oh, well, I, oh. I, 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 something just occurred to me, you know, and it, it's becomes kind of such a, a, a practice or, or a habit. 
Um, but in addition to the protection is, is just routine STI checks um, yes. and just normalizing that. You know, we, we talk about it openly with each other, you know, say, all right, six months since our last one, let's go in for a checkup, even though, even if we've had no one enter into the relationship, it's just one of those, it's a little bit of blood, a little bit of urine, and then you are at least have some reasonable guarantee that there have been no surprises in, within the past six months. Yeah, you it, can't communicate about a status you don't know about. Exactly. <laughs> And actually, it's oddly difficult to get STI tests if you're married and your doctor knows that. They're like, why are you, why are you worried about this? I'm like, well, I told you last time I'm not monogamous. And they assume that you mean that you're cheating. And it's very, very strange. And like, sometimes I don't necessarily want to get into it with a particular lab tech or doctor or something. But um, actually, it's something as far as STI and safety. Um, my partner and I, you know, we have a fairly, or Danny and I, my husband, we have a pretty... Um, nuanced view of this, like what Benny was saying, you know, with about rates of transmission and risk and so on. Um, but he, my, he's also immunocompromised. Danny has a condition that means that he's a little bit more vulnerable. And so I actually for a while was dating someone who had HSV-1, which most people do have. I am actually negative and so is Danny. We're pretty rare in that way. And so it was one of those things where, you know, I actually had to if I really wanted to stay away from any potential for HSV-1 infection, had to use a lot of protection. You know, people don't think about it, but gloves and dental dams and all these things that people think are silly or unnecessary. So um, I actually asked Danny, I said, you know, how, what, what rate of potential transmission are you comfortable with? And it sounds like a weird clinical thing to ask, but really it was an act of love. It was an act of trust. And, uh, you know, um, I'm done with that relationship and we're both still negative. All right. So we talked a little bit about being outside the community and finding partners. Um, so you run into people in your everyday life. Some of them are going to be people that you're, you're interested in potentially dating. How do you bring up polyamory to somebody who you have no idea where they stand on this? I mean, it's... It sounds a bit weird to some people, but my primary dating resource lately has been Tinder. I actually have found reasonable success, and not just bots who want to get me to become Tinder verified. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's a little blurb on my profile. Um, I, if I recall correctly, it says, you know, I am non-monogamous. So I just kind of put it out there. Um, and it's, if, if someone's interested in me, they'll swipe Right? I think it's been a while since I've been in Tinder, but <laughs> right is good, right? Can, okay, well, we'll just assume right is right. <laughs> right is good. So, but, you know, it, it kind of puts it out there so that it doesn't have to be a surprise. It doesn't have to be, because um, some people get upset when you, if, if you don't, aren't op open about it at all up front, and the, they may feel like you've deceived them or, you know, trying to betray them, um, but it's, I just kind of try to avoid that whole conversation and just put it out there out front. The answer for me for the original question is I generally don't. If I don't know that they already know I'm poly or if I don't know they're poly, I'm not going to ask to date them or have sex with them or something because I have had men get incredibly angry at me when they find out that I'm not cheating. Like, they may know I'm in a relationship, and they're okay with cheating, but they're not okay with non-monogamy, because they think it's weird, and it betrays some monogamous principle. Like, as long as you pretend you're monogamous, but you cheat, it's fine, because you're at least, in that way, being sort of normal with society. But what I'm doing is too crazy and too out there, and I have legit had dudes freak out on me. So the answer is, I don't. I just, you know, I hope that they Google me. I mean, I, I sometimes drop hints like, if you Google just my first name, you can find out everything about me. And that's my way of like, find out on Polly, and if you think I'm cute, we can talk. But yeah, I don't, unless I know someone is or I've established, even I'm on OkCupid, but when people message me, one of the first things I ask them in my reply is, you know, if it's a good message, I'll say thank you for the great message. You saw that I'm Polly, right? Because some people don't read that far. And then suddenly they're like, wait, you have a husband? What? I'm like, yes, he's also on this website. Do you want to see his profile? Um, it, it's really bizarre the way people operate. You know, they're, they're more okay with something that's pretending to be normative than something that's outside of the norm. 
Um, although I'm not looking for partners, uh, I'm never looking for partners, they occasionally happen. Um, <laughs> but uh, I want to broaden the question just a touch to people who are not potential partners, but just being out about being poly in the world. Um, I am sort of aggressively out about a lot of things. Um, so all of my coworkers know that I'm poly, and it comes up just the same way any other sort of conversation thing would, right? We're talking about families, and I talk about my spouse, and I talk about my boyfriend, and I talk about the kid, and I talk about my squeeze, and eventually a question comes up, wait, you said boyfriend, and then you said spouse, who are people? And then I show off pictures of my wedding, and you know, um, like, it, it, it comes up, I just like talk the way that I would normally comfortably talk if I was the norm, and then answer questions when they happen. I'm really comfortable doing that. It may not work for everybody, um, but I just, I hate closets. I'm really bad at them, so I just don't do it. <laughs> and I haven't really come to a place where I would know how to be open about anything. Like, I don't even want my parents to know I'm considering, <laughs> so. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I lie to my parents. That's. <laughs> 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 they, so, no, honestly, though, they, they used to know and they handled it really badly. Um, and to protect them and protect our relationship, uh, there's a bunch of stuff they don't know. That's fine. <laughs> right. It's like, just don't Google me, mom and dad, and we'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I still don't even know how to make eye contact with someone I'm interested in. The only way I ended up with my husband was because he was very open about the fact. And, and in some ways, that was the best way to have a relationship. It was very scary at first because he was like, I really like you. And I'm like, you're scaring me, but you're kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> and a follow-up question. Have you run into trouble when you tell people that you're poly? Obviously, Hina, you covered one situation. There's also, I guess I didn't bring this up, but really, really hostile lesbians. I mean, they're already hostile because I'm femme and I also sleep with men, so they already hate me on some level, but sometimes they still want to fuck me, but then they find out I'm poly and it's all over. Even though there are, like, there's so many lesbian poly communities, it's just, if you also have sex with men, then you're not okay. That's one, that's one strike too many. Um, yeah. Gay men are, are very similar. Um, I get very little pushback, largely because I'm living in really liberal cities, um, but... Uh, I get very little pushback from people like coworkers and um, and and students at my university. That that stuff is uh, rarely a big deal. Um, but when my boyfriend and I spend time in gay spaces and people find out that we are married uh, to other people, um, we have gotten some pretty extreme aggression. Um, and not just going from like being attracted to us to not attracted to us, um, but uh, like you're you're not welcome here. You're not gay enough. Um, I'm like we're we're pretty. I mean. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, uh, and, and that's, that's frustrating, right? Because uh, this is a community that we really do want to be connected to, and these are guys that we want to be friends with or like maybe take home once in a while. Um, and, uh, and I would say that we get more negative than positive in those spaces, unfortunately. I mean, you know, kind of what they talked about earlier. I, I, I Broke the news to my parents in November because I, uh, I was like, well, I don't want to spend Christmas with either or family, so I'm going to see if I can spend Christmas with both my families and bring my family down with me to meet my family. And that didn't go over well. Um, and we haven't really spoken since. Um, you know, as, as far as um, friends go, um, you know, like I mentioned, the, the secular community I'm involved with is, is very, very heavily poly already, so it, it's... Um, by its nature, I, I've, I've never felt like I'm, I've been uh, not welcome in those spaces. Um, and then as far as like work goes, my boss knows I'm, I'm poly because I mentioned to him that uh, uh, my girlfriend and I broke up and she moved out. And then I mentioned that uh, I was uh, still doing activities with her kids in my house. Um, and he was kind of like, wait, you, your ex's kids still live with you even though your ex moved out? And so that kind of opened the door of, well, uh, this is polyamory. I'm, I'm living with my former partner's partner, um, taking care of the kids. Um, I, but that's about the most I've ever been able to bring it up at work. Not because I feel like uh, it would be rejected, but simply because it's really hard to fit into a conversation. You know, like, oh, I think we missed these requirements on this system. And by the way, my, uh, wa my girlfriend has a husband, and my, I have another partner in addition to her. You know, it's, it's um, I guess, 
It, it is possible, you know, my, my, uh, my friend, my former metamor, he was able to bring it, kind of bring it up at a work relevant uh, conversation in that they were at a work function and he said, yeah, I did this thing with my wife last week and then about five, ten minutes later he said, yeah, by the way, I went, you know, I did this other thing with my girlfriend last week and some of his coworkers were like, wait, wife and girlfriend? What? I'm, not, I'm not following. And so you can work it in, but um, into the conversation that way, but I don't know, it, it's, I've, I've, I guess, with the exception of my family, I've, I've never really been in a space where I've had the, the privilege to acknowledge that, uh, of being in spaces where nobody's ever made me feel unwelcome because I'm polyamorous. My first job, my first quote unquote real office job, I got because of polyamory. I met this person off of OKQ because we were both poly, and the date didn't go well, but it ended up being a friendship. And I'm friends with their partner as well. And uh, w they were the supervisor of a small department, and one of their people left. And we'd stayed friends. And so I got hired to my first real job, which was a stepping stone into the career that I really want, that I have now. So when people say, oh, d wouldn't you being open about Polly ruin your chances of getting hired? I'm like, well, let me tell you a story. <laughs> So, but yeah, I'm not actually out at the office anymore. I just started at this job three weeks ago. I work for the University of California. I don't think anybody would care, but um, it's one of those things where it's like, because my only other steady relationship, as it were, is long distance. It's not like, you know, I mean, I could have said, oh, this weekend, oh yeah, I'm going to Skepticon and I'm going to see my boyfriend, but it just, I don't know. It sometimes can feel, I guess, I guess old geek habits die hard. Because I used to hang out with a bunch of male geeks who whined at me incessantly about how they couldn't find girlfriends. And so if I got any, like, relationship, love, sex, whatever, I couldn't say anything because they would feel bad about it and shame me about it. Because they were like, oh, you have all these people and I have nobody. I'm like, sorry? <laughs> so my, my, my instinct is to, towards secrecy. It, my Muslim background doesn't help either. We never talked about anything in my family. So. Um. The only thing I will add is uh, if you tell your parents that you're in a poly relationship, be prepared to find out more about their sex lives. <laughs> so I have a question here. Do you have advice for poly people struggling with depression or the partners of those people? And I think I'd like to open that up a little bit more generally about um, mental illness, because obviously there are more things that can affect that. I'm not sure specifically about any specific depression or mental illness, but as we've just talked about how it would be to have a family and open up to be poly, we've discussed the fact that, you know, there's no chance of us not having a primary relationship. Like our marriage, our kids will always come first, but sometimes when you have a really rough day, the only thing you want to do is to be with the person you love or, you know, who makes you feel comfortable. And we've discussed the fact that, you know, if we were in a point where we were dating someone else who had a really terrible day, the automatic response would be, come on over. Like, we can't necessarily drop everything with our family, but What's that? even if it's both of us or one okay. of us, we'd do whatever we could to be there for the other person. Yeah, I mean, for me, the biggest blessing has been that kind of family dynamic of, um, you know, the way our, our relationship was, was built. Um, you know, once, you know, maybe after the, once you kind of, you easily became a fixture in the family. And so you had that, that support network for when things were really crappy, when your brain was just being really mean to you on a, on a particular day, you'd come over, you know, you had like three, three people to kind of help you through the day, um, cook, cook dinner for you and, and support you through that. Um, and so it's, it's, that, that's for me, one of the biggest strengths of, of, uh, how I practice polyamory is that, that family dynamic and that acknowledging that that's not the, the shoe that must fit everyone, um, but it is a potential benefit of polyamory. Yeah, I, I find that benefit to be mostly true as well. Um, so to be sort of specific, um, when when I'm dealing with something that's really difficult in uh, in my life in some way, um, I want to be able to reach out to the people who are really close to me to uh, help me with whatever that issue is. And if that issue is um, something like illness with a partner, um, 
being poly means that I can reach out to a few more people, that there are a few more people in my like really close trusted circle that I can reach out to for support for me so I can support my sick partner, right? Um, and, and vice versa. It also means that if there's something really hard going on for me, that my partners have some additional support. Um, just uh, sort of as an example, um, my, my boyfriend got a concussion uh, a couple of years ago, um, and he did it in a really stupid way, too. Um, he, he very much did it to himself, but he's learned his lesson. Um, and uh, he um, was really frustrated with this. Peter's like a, like working all the time, like do stuff or I'm super miserable kind of a guy. And having multiple people to kind of be around for a little bit and like make sure that he took medicine and relaxed um, and had people to just talk to so that he didn't have to like sit alone on a couch, which would be so bad for him, uh, was, was just really helpful. Luckily it was not really extreme. He wasn't out for like weeks and weeks and weeks like sometimes happens. Um, but that was, uh, that was a circumstance in which having a larger family was really, really uh, helpful for us. We're also, we're raising a kid, like Pickle is nine um, and I've been helping raise him since he was two years old uh, and um, Having, I have to say, having like three full-time and a couple of part-time adults in your life to help raise a child makes it way easier. It's so much easier than only having one or two people around. A, a lot of that, ex, that family dynamic we're talking about applies to my family, even though nobody in my family is poly besides me that I know of, because I have a large Indian extended family and everybody lives in the same area. And so a lot of what I see you know, as benefits as far as family structure go with poly, you know, it's, it relates to my background. So to me, it's not even that weird to have, you know, multiple adults raising a child. My aunts and my cousins raised me just as much as my parents did in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, to go back specifically to the question, I personally um, don't have a lot of experience with it, but Miri, who blogs on The Orbit at Brute Reason, um, who, who co-blogs on, on our network, The Orbit, um, she, um, writes about this quite a bit. And uh, Everyday Feminism is a website I have a complicated relationship with because some of it's really garbage, especially about Muslim issues, cough, cough. But um, they, they do have a lot of articles about polyamory and mental illness that are really spot on and written by some really smart people. So whoever it was that asked that question, um, there are resources out there available to you. Actually, now would be a good time. Are there, you know, we, we've talked about the fact that a lot of advice is very standard and doesn't necessarily apply to a lot of people. Are there places you recommend to go for advice? Franklin Vo's website was the one that I sent everybody to and now he and his partner have a book out called More Than Two. And that's the one I generally send people to because it doesn't assume you were mono before, but it also doesn't assume that you weren't. Um, there's not a lot of assumptions in the book. The whole book is about bringing down your assumptions and figuring your, your shit out. And even if you're monogamous, I feel like that book is really great because it's all about, you know, talking about explicit boundaries, talking about explicit expectations and, you know, not assuming things in relationships, which sounds easy, but really we operate on assumptions constantly. And Second Ed, more than two is the best book out there right now. I kind of use Facebook. I have lots of Facebook friends who are in poly community, so they'll share something and there'll be a discussion about it. And I can, even if I'm not communicating with the thing happening, I can read what they said and the things they think are terrible about it or the things they think were great about it or a lot of people will provide other resources. And then we'll watch TV and there'll be something terrible. All the relationships on TV are awful, like completely awful, terrible, and horrible. And we'll discuss how we would come up with a way to work around whatever issue was or how that would work in our lives or just talk about how terrible the people are. I love that. Lots of laughs. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in a third for more than two, uh, which is three, which is more than two, right? That works. It's like exactly like uh, Hina mentioned, it's, it's communication. You, you can, it, even if you're not opening up your relationship, you can take all those, those principles that it talks about and, you know, it, it feels awkward at first of like, you know, especially during sex of like, can I do this? Are you okay with this? Are you comfortable with this? Um, and, but it, it makes sure that everyone's on the same page. And so and, and all the, this poly advice tends to focus on communicating boundaries, communicating desires. Um, and you can easily take that, well, I shouldn't say easily, but you can take that back to uh, non-polyamorous relationships as well.
And actually, just quickly, because communication comes up a lot with poly people, but there's a step before that that I think we forget to talk about sometimes, and that's self-awareness. Yes. Because yep. you can't communicate what you want if you really have no fucking clue what you want. And so, you know, you got to start with know, know thyself and then go from there. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it is possible, though, in, in that, that kind of um, conversation with your partners of that kind of self-discovery, kind of like, you know, therapy where you talk to your therapist and then you have that epiphany because you vocalize something that, that made you reflect on it. And so uh, maybe, there's almost maybe a bit of chicken and egg thing there where, you know, good communication helps you realize yourself and then realizing yourself helps improve your communication. I feel like one of the best things about my relationship and how it worked out really well is uh, Stephen was previously poly before we met. Um, we actually didn't even discuss whether we were going to be monogamous until we were dating for a little bit. And like his open communication made it okay for me to communicate openly. And it, it was very eye opening. I'd never dated or been in a relationship with someone that was that open, or even my family. We we're all very secretive. <laughs> I, um, I'd like to toss out two other book resources with caveats. Um, so the book that used to get recommended in poly circles all the time is uh, titled The Ethical Slut. Um, and I do recommend reading it with the caveat that it is um, more about how poly has been done in previous decades than about how it's done now, and we've learned a lot more. So I would say that if you're also going to read more than two. Um, and I would also say that Opening Up by Tristan Terramino is worth reading for couples who are entering into polyamory together. Um, it is definitely aimed at that audience more so, uh, but it shows a lot of different options for open relationships rather than just polyamory. Um, and I like that aspect of it quite a bit. So I'd put that in there with the caveat that it does sort of expect that people are couples entering into poly together, um, but it can be valuable for those, those people. And it does have some valuable communications tools in, as, in it as well. All right, we have a host of questions here actually about terminology and, and really what poly does or doesn't mean. Um, <coughs> We have a question about monogamous and whether that falls under polyamory and the difference between poly and swingers, if there is any, and is it still polyamory if it isn't sex? Does anybody have any, any particularly strong feelings about terminology? <laughs> does anybody not have any particularly strong feelings about terminology? Okay, does anybody have particularly strong feelings about terminology that they think are based on something reasonable? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I've had, I resist being called polyamorous and I stick to poly because people get mad at me because I have casual sex. Um, they're like, polyamory means multiple loves and you're not loving every one night stand you have, are you? And I'm like, well. Maybe you just love the sex. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm in a polyamorous relationship with sex. God. We need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but. But yeah, um, so people pushing back at me for terminology is why I use certain terms. Um, I do actually have a decent amount of experience with the swinger scene. It's a little, it's a couple of years out of date now, but I used to engage in the swinger scene with my then boyfriend. Um, so the difference is not that different actually in certain ways. Um, there are definitely swingers who you could confuse for a, a, a more traditional poly person. And there are definitely poly people who you might see more as swingers. But swingers, one thing that I would say separates most poly people from most swingers is um, swingers are really, really hardcore believers in marriage. Like they tend to be all about marriage. They really, really respect the couple as a unit. If I fuck someone's husband, she'll come up to me and be like, um, I appreciate you pleasuring him or something. Like, it's weird to me. It was very strange to me. Like, my, my boyfriend would go have sex with someone at this par swinger party, and the, the, the person would come to me and be like, thank you for sharing him. I'm like, I didn't share him. He chose to go have sex with you. But for them, the couple, the married couple especially, the heterosexual couple, more often than not, is sort of the primal unit as opposed to the individual. And that approach sort of dictates how they do it. Also, they tend to be more like weekend and evening and weekend people. So it's not, they're not the types of people who will usually go to work and be like, yeah, I'm a swinger. Swinging is something you kind of do, um, you pursue in your spare time. That's kind of the perception, I think. 
Um, the other difference that's important to my life for swinging is that uh, traditionally, although I hear this is changing a little bit in a few places, which is great, but traditionally swinging culture has been extremely unfriendly to queer men. Mm -hmm. um, there has been an expectation that all women are bisexual and all men are straight and that any other option for gender does not exist. Um, so that means I have no experience as a very queer transgender man. Uh, I have no experience with swinging because I never found a place that, that would be even allowing me through the door. Some of, yeah, I mean, some of them don't even allow bisexual men, even if those men never do anything with other men at the party. It, they just straight up bar you. Otherwise it sounds fun. <laughs> and we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have a couple of questions here about children, and we've touched on children a couple of times. Is there anything else that folks really want to, to talk about in terms of having kids and polyamory? Um, yeah, I would, I would like to briefly touch on um, the most frequent question that we get about kids, uh, which is, how did you tell them? Um, we didn't. Uh, we exist, and he asks questions and we answer them. Um, but the first time we realized that, uh, that Pickle understood that my relationship with Peter was, which I was the first, um, I was the first person to enter into their relationship. I'm the first person that either Peter or his wife dated. Um, so, uh, and that has worked. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, about a year after Peter and I started dating, I slept over there, but I slept in the other room. Um, they had a guest room at the time, it's now been filled. Um, but, uh, he, he said, oh, Benny slept over, and, and Peter said, yeah, he slept over, and Pickle said, why didn't he sleep in your room? So I generally sleep in Peter's room ever since then. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's got um, a very sort of particular uh, position on what his family is that he decided on his own. We didn't tell him that his family now includes me or that it now includes Matt, um, who is my boyfriend's wife's boyfriend who lives there full time. Um, and uh, he decided when I was a family member because he was asked at school to draw what his family was and it was mom and dad and Pickle and the two dogs and Benny and the chickens. <laughs> so it's a broad identity of family, but I, I got included along with the dogs, so that was great. Um, and Matt joined that picture as he's been sort of talking about who his family is around the time that Matt moved in. Um, so. It, it for us ended up being much more of a like, let him decide for himself who counts, um, who's important to him, let him form his own relationships, because that's fundamentally what Polly is about for us. It's that every individual person has a right to decide what our relationships with other people are. Um, and we don't get to decide that for the kid any more than we get to decide that for our partners. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this would be the second uh, polyamorous relationship I entered that involved uh, uh, my partner had kids. And each time it's happened, they've just been kind of like, okay, cool. You know, it's, um, we've never really codified what my relationship is to the kids as far as a label. Um, you know, our, 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 the middle child is all kind of, has sometimes referred to me as second dad. Otherwise, I've been kind of the weird uncle. Um, but it, it's, you know, to, to what Hina said about, you know, having, having that extended family, it's, it, it really is that kind of takes a village to raise a child dynamic. And... It's nice building that village. Um, you know, even, even though uh, my partner is no longer uh, directly in the picture anymore, I've got a very, very strong family uh, with my former metamor and our three kids. We live happily all together in the same house. And it's, it's, it's not, I think, what most people envision when they, they think about a polyamorous family. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the, the kids are fine with it. Um, we never had to hide it, you know, like they would just right off the bat, like, okay, you know, the, this, this guy's dating mom, my mom's dating this other person, and um, all right, cool, yeah. And, and just kind of slowly and easily moved into just this kind of parental, but not mom or dad role. My, my only real experience with it would be we recently got the, well, it was for the two year old, or gonna be two, uh, a dollhouse, and it came with a mom and a dad and a baby. And I'm like, well, we're going to have to get more people to go with this because we don't want them to get the wrong idea. <laughs> Poly problems. Yes. <laughs> okay, we are running up on our time. Um, we have a couple of questions about legal stuff here that I'm not entirely sure that, that we're necessarily the best folks to answer. Um, although I will say 
that I know of at least one polyamorous relationship that is suddenly now in jeopardy because um, Trump is not keen on NAFTA and somebody's in the US on a NAFTA visa. And so that situation can kind of suck. Legal situations kind of suck in general. I mean, basically what you get with a monogamous marriage is a set of contracts that have a bunch of legal precedent around them. Um, so there are ways to deal with it. They're just not as straightforward, as inexpensive, um, or as proven to stand up in court. So, um, but we are, as I said, coming up on the end of this. Are there th anything here that we want to touch on that you wanted to talk about, you wanted to talk about something special about, or something unusual about how you deal with Polly, but except Nola is looking at me like she has something yeah, to say about I, legal stuff. I, no, it oh, wasn't okay. about legal stuff. If, um, it's not actually something I have to add. It's a question I would have for my other panelists. I'm curious about how you do it with your partners. Um, I, my mostly experience is hearing from other people. I've heard some people are very open about who they're dating and sometimes people want to meet all the other partners and sometimes people don't and sometimes people just don't have any interest in introducing partners to each other. And I'm curious how that is handled. My experience has run the gamut that way. I've dated people whose partners wanted to know that I existed but didn't want to meet me at all. And I have met, I have dated people whose partners ended up being very close to me. And even after the relationship ended, I'm still friends with that person. Um, so, it, it, and everything in between. Um, with me and my husband, it's pretty open. We, we don't necessarily, like we don't, like some people get sort of sexually gratified from hearing about their partner's exploits and it's not quite that way for us. It's more, we, we really truly enjoy each other being happy. And so when he hears about all the fun I had, or I hear about all the fun he had, or more often than not, I push him into having fun because he's too shy. Um, and I'm like, no, 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 he really wants to fuck you. You should go, you should do it. Um, and you know, and it's great. It's just, it's just, to me, it's a net increase in happiness. And frankly, like, I'm a busy person and I get tired and I don't wanna be anybody's one and only. So I like it when they get to have fun and do other things with other people. And, you know, it's, it's, it is, obviously sex is a different thing from like board gaming, but you know, my husband has his tabletop gaming group and I'm just as happy that he has his friends there and it's not necessarily something I'm involved with, but he has a good time and I get some alone time and it's great. Um, but yeah, dealing with a, a person who doesn't want to meet me, who's dating someone I'm dating, especially if it's a close relationship, can be very difficult um, because I like to have that connection and I don't like to feel like the dirty little secret. Um, but sometimes it happens and I know that not everybody's as open or flexible to that sort of thing as me, so I generally rein it in and try to sort of go with their pace, but it can be challenging. For me, it varies dramatically based on which relationship, um, because I ideally like to meet everybody that my partners date, uh, but that is impossible with Hino because we live so far apart. So that's just a functional thing. Um, and I don't really care about meeting everybody that my partners sleep with, which would be entirely unreasonable with Hina, not super reasonable with my other partners either. Um, it, like, that's just not that important to me. <laughs> you, live in, you live in California. <laughs> um, but so, th th yeah, I mean, it's, it's dependent upon the situation for me rather than creating some firm rule, which actually would be the only piece of like, advice that I give about Polly ever is, man, be flexible, because situations change. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of take a laissez-faire as, as far as do whatever you want. Um, I, you know, Polly can take very, very many forms, and it's cool when it does. For me personally, um, I've got a, a strict rule of um, that my partner's partners have to know I exist. You know, we don't have to meet, but I, they do, do know I have to exist. I've been the dirty little secret before because I wasn't a good Hindu boy, and I really have no desire to be in that position again. Um, so, plus it, it just, it, it, you know, it, it carries implications that um, not everybody is on the same page uh, when, when they're having to hide their partners from their other partner. Um, but, and it, it's a balance between, I, you know, I shy away personally from the, the veto power, you know, that, that uh, all your partners must meet my approval. That's, that's not my style of, of how I want to run my relationships. But... I do want to always consider the, uh, the feelings and the, uh, the thoughts of, of my partners if I'm going to bring someone into that, that what I call the circle of trust. You know, if, if I'm going on a date with someone, 
I'll let them know that I'm going on a date with someone, but I won't necessarily have that sit down conversation of, you know, how do you feel about this person, you know, until, you know, we reach a point where maybe this person will start having dinner with the family, you know, spending a lot of time at the house with us, because then you have to start taking into consideration of, of the social dynamic. And if your partner really, really, really hates that person, um, forcing them to sit at the same, same dinner table as them would be kind of unfair to them. So it's, it's kind of a fuzzy gray line, I feel. But we would be remiss if we didn't bring up the don't ask, don't tell. Because that's, it happens a lot. It's a relationship where people see other people and have sex with other people, but they don't tell their partners by design. And the idea there is that the other partner doesn't want to know about it, doesn't want to deal with it, doesn't want to consider it. Um, as you might imagine, it's short-lived generally. Um, although I do know of a relationship that lasted 10 years that way, but then they eventually went full open poly. Um, but yeah, it's something that happens. You may encounter it. The only problem with that is how the hell do you verify? That's my thing. I'm like, every single monogamous married man could be lying who says that. How do I know? So I generally, I don't go there. Um, but, but plenty of people do. So I, I just didn't want to make, I wanted to make sure people knew that actually existed. All right. I think that is our time. Thank you to all my panelists. Thank you to everybody who gave us a question. There was no way we were going to get through all of them. Um, but I hope we got through a, a decent number. So thanks, everybody.